So hello to everybody. Um, very happy about this. Uh, we are very happy about this this webinar, uh, which is uh, uh, it's going to be very interesting because it is a collaboration. Not only because we have very interesting people, but also because it is a collaboration between three important um, institutions, which are you know uh, Culture Hub, La Mama. Um, IFNAB Community Network and Soda School of Digital Art, and two based in New, in New York and one in Manchester. And we have, you know, the representative of this institution. I'm also personally part of Soda, but we have um, uh, Fido Segrera, uh, who is uh, an artist working international or on art and technology, working with artificial intelligence, VR, etc. Asher Emito Toledo, who is the founder and director of uh, uh, iPhone app community network, which is an international network, which gather, you know, people from art and technology field from all over the world. And um, Asha Kurneya and David Jackson from uh, Soda School of Digital Art, which is a new institution and a new school of digital art, even if, you know, it's not only a school, because we have also exhibition spaces, so we produce, we work with artists, we do Many things, I say we, because I'm also part, I'm the curator of the Soda Gallery, even if we have changed the name in Modal, but I mean, I mean, I'm, I mean, uh, I'm still saying Soda Gallery and uh, lecturer um, at, at Manchester Metropolitan University. So the first part of this conversation is going to be around the work of, of Fito through a dialogue with Asher. Uh, and the second part uh, will be uh, about, you know, um, the work uh, Marsha and David are developing and uh, on, uh, art and, uh, on artificial intelligence with Soda. And it's going to be especially the second one, very more, more uh, let's say, you know, uh, like a, uh, with questions and more theological. So Asher, if you want to introduce uh, Fido briefly and, you know, just open the dance, as we say in Italy. Oh, yes. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. And I'm very excited uh, uh, also to be to be here today because uh, for over two years, we've been talking about this uh, co exciting collaboration between uh, Soda and uh, Hyphen Hub and, and uh, Culture Hub. And, it's, uh, and of course, when we were ready to launch it, the pandemic happened and everything got frozen. So it is um, it is really great because we are here like a, I'm on a group of friends. So it's going to be the conversation in the in the style of a fire chat, as they say, you know, very very casual. And we invite the audience to also participate. If there is um, a, ask questions, and otherwise we'll ask. The, we have a lot of questions to all of us here. And it's, um, so we have. Um, um, we decided to invite uh, Fito Segreira, who's an artist from, he's based in Colombia, in Cartagena. Uh, Fito, uh, he was previously the, um, I met Fito in Shanghai, uh, like about eight years ago or more, when he was the director of the laboratory at Cronus, Cronus Art Center in Shanghai, which is a, a very important institution in, the, in research, art, and um, AI. Uh, then he moved to back to Colombia when uh, China closed down, and and it's just uh, and he's been uh, continued doing very interesting work in this field of story digital storytelling. Uh, his work um, is uh, always at the frontiers of uh, philosophy, I would say neuroscience, you know, and uh, uh, art, and you know, and 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 um, I would say working together with all the, with the general public. Uh, I think because uh, Fito and I, we are both, both uh, born in Colombia, we, uh, I think naturally we have a tendency to be a little bit uh, political and uh, more social. You know, our words cannot be totally detached and make it look all pure technology because uh, our, um, our, our countries have gone through like a, a lot more, uh, you know, things, material, and, you know, so it's always, always embedded in the technology. Um, so I will start with um, <clears throat> with Fito. Why don't you just um, tell us a little bit what uh, we're gonna, what you want to present today, and then we we go from there. Thank you, Asher, and uh, hello everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's very nice to be here and have this space for sharing 
um, works around the topics of uh, storytelling, communities, technologies, new ways of storytelling actually, or different ways of storytelling. And uh, I, I will be showing two pieces or I will be very briefly introducing two of my works. Um, one of them was when I was uh, maybe over 10 years ago when I was uh, here in Colombia and you will see um, what Asher was actually saying right now, which is the influence of the context in, in our work when we are, I mean, for us, when we are working here in Colombia as artists, we cannot, uh, you know, we cannot just exclude the context. It's, it's almost impossible. Uh, so you will see that reflected in the first piece. And then my second piece was produced, of course, when, when I was already in Shanghai a few years back, so it's, a, it's very different in terms of context, yeah? But in terms of technologies and techniques for storytelling, they are similar. So these are two works that uh, both use um, brain technologies, brain computer interfaces and software or uh, you know, custom software in order to somehow create different types of stories. Um, I want to start sharing my screen with you guys. So Give me a second. All right. So this first piece I want to share with you guys is called Data Sphere. And it's a piece um, maybe 10 years old, maybe a bit more. Uh, it was an invitation I got from a gallery here in Colombia. They, they asked me to go to an island, which is right here in front of my hometown. Um, 10 minutes on a boat. It's a very poor island. Uh, it has, um, th there's an Afro-descendant community that moved there many, many years ago and claimed the land. Uh, but uh, the state has never looked after them. They have never, uh, you know, they, they abandoned them basically like many other communities here in Latin America. So it's, it's quite poor. And they invite me there and they ask me to do some sort of intervention there. But um, but I'm not, you know, the type of artist who makes public interventions. Um, so at the time, I was already working with a very basic computer, uh, brain computer interface. So I decided to take it with me, that, a USB camera, my laptop, and, and a phone. And I created this system in, in, during, when I was there, which um, was always recording my point of view, let's say, from my forehead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give play while I talk. Yeah, so I use this on my face, on my head, on my forehead, the camera, and at the same time I was wearing an EG, and which is a for those who don't know what an, what an EG is, is basically um, a piece of technology used by doctors to measure your brain waves and by researchers to try to understand the behavior of the brain and what it measures is electrical uh, changes uh, on your skull or through your skull. So that device helps um, to understand a bit how your brain is working in different moments. And what I did was a very basic classifier algorithm, classifying algorithm that will somehow determine based on my brain waves uh, and based on some research, possible mental states. And then it will take um, that mental state as a keyword for a uh, search online in the in the case of this work was on twitter and grab tweets that were being written uh, during that time and that were related to whatever the system was telling about my inner state you know? and then i will i will just render them on the screen as they were coming through um, and then at the end of this whole experience, I got like a seven day long uh, piece of work, which was my point of view or my visual point of view all the time while I was, um, while I was in the island and uh, measuring my brain waves and creating some sort of narrative out of my inner state. But we have to understand that uh, this narrative was also written by other minds, by other people. By uh, so, so it was somehow um, the system and my body and my mind became a sort of channel 
for bridging two very different worlds, like the online world with all of its comments and ideas and you know, and, and this small community in this island, which don't, don't, they don't even have access to the internet at this time. They don't, they don't even have fresh water there. So imagine, so at the end, it was quite beautiful because I was not, I, I still didn't understand what I was doing at the time. It was, you know, on the run as I went. And at the end, I took this whole piece of video and projected it on a abandoned uh, space in the island, on the island. And people started to come with chairs and even popcorns and they started to watch the whole thing. And it was very, very long. And they came day after day to watch and they started to see themselves from a very different perspective, from the point of view of a, of a guy who, although we are from the same country, I am very much a foreigner to them. And at the same time, they started to read these comments. And some of those comments were quite intense. And um, they started to ask themselves questions. And they started to ask me questions. They asked me if that's what I thought about them, if that's what I wrote about them. And it was very difficult to me to explain what was actually happening in terms of technology there. But at the end, this piece became a very important material for them and they keep it in a in in a house which they call the culture uh, institute or the culture house of the town which has a very few um you know art pieces in there but they they really wanted to keep it because they felt um it mean it meant something for them you know so that's agnosis it's, it's a first it was my first attempt to create a sort of narrative at that time I was very much involved in documentary filmmaking, especially experimental documentary filmmaking. So this was a, um, a very um, appropriate way at the time to solve, let's say artistically, to solve the piece. The second piece I want to share with you guys today is called Agnosis, The Lost Memories. And this is a piece I did much later um, not much, maybe five years later. Um, I was already living in Shanghai at the time and my context was very different. There was no uh, poverty around. There, there, there were no you know, uh, vulnerable communities where I was living at the time. Um, it gave me the space and the resources to think about technology in a more um, general way rather than a contextualized, you know, uh, way, manner, let's say. So Agnosis, um, it's a, another brain computer interface based system, but a bit more complex because it tried to deal with the idea of memory and the idea of capturing a memory. And, and, and even more interesting, uh, from my point of view, the idea of giving a system, an intelligent system, uh, my brain data as, as an intimate act. Yeah, I give it to the system. This intelligent system takes my data and somehow based on a few set of rules that I give, it returns uh, a, a something back to me. And this something that it returns is a lost memory and it's returned in different formats, which I then can experience, I can share, I can show. So this is one of the, the results of the, of the original, of the first experiment I did of agnosis. And let me show you a bit how it works very quickly. So a, a memory in this system is basically made out of an image from a camera, uh, the brain data, a GPS data, a gyroscope uh, sensor, and an accelerometer sensor, which were all embedded into one uh, object, uh, one system, let's say. So the visual memory, of course, which is what my eyes were seeing at the moment, the physical memory, which is all the data from the sensors, which determine how my body was moving, how my body was rotating and where I was. Uh, the brain memory, which is all my mental activity at the moment. And then all that stuff 
combined, I mean, the, the brain computer interface with the camera, the portable computer resulted in two things, a book and a series of images. So the book is basically a, um, it, it's like a, like a memoir. It's like a, like just a, 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 a diary, you could say, of all these memories being understood by the machine and being uh, printed, being plotted by the machine as in, in the form of uh, poetry, let's say, or or a textual narrative. So each lost memory, and let, and let me, I, I will tell you uh, in a few seconds what, what a lost memory meant in this piece, but each lost memory was uh, then interpreted as the system and uh, used to write a poem, which was then given back to me. And, and it, when I wrote, when I started to read this poem, I could definitely relate to them. I could definitely uh, relate to the context I was, the context I was when I, when the memory was taken. Um, even when I looked at the image, which is related to the poem, you could see how this was working. For instance, when my attention level, because the, the wearable uh, EEG was basically measuring my attention all the time. So when my attention level went below certain threshold, it will capture a memory. Yeah, what I called a lost memory. That lost memory will be an image like the one you see here. And then that image with all the sensor data, which is up here, plus the brain data uh, will be sent to a system that will generate, will cut out a, pe a piece that it uh, somehow found uh, interesting, I could say, or detected in the image and then cut it out and based on the data, data create a sort of 3D sculpture that um, eventually will become part of a larger composition, visual composition that I will show you now. And at the same time, it will use um, an object detection uh, algorithm to detection different objects and recognize different things in the in the image and use them to create the poetry as the as the initial keywords to create the poetry yeah so at the end the compositions were they, they look more or less like this the visual ones they were all based on uh, each of each of these objects that you see flying it's one of those lost memories that has been already treated by the system based on a set of rules and then positioned on on top of a photograph uh, of the space where they were captured but and, and they are rendered also uh, based on the data in, in the order I mean the position of, of each of these memories on the image is based on the data that was collected by the sensors so it's a sort of um, in that sense it it, it it tells a story. Um, it tells a story about um, lost memories, moments that I don't remember, and they are given back to me um, in the form of data that then gets rendered with, with a sort of logic. Yeah, and that logic somehow tells me something about what was happening there. Um, each of these memories are, are then positioned on the image based on the GPS data. They are uh, rotated based on the um, uh, the gyroscope data, yeah, and and so this um, keeps uh, meaning very abstract terms uh, keeps um, my in a way my physical memory, which is which was based on movement and rotation and acceleration, so on and so forth. So yeah so so then eventually uh we took this project with uh with asher actually and uh hyphen hub and uh some other institutions here in colombia maybe over a year ago we took it to a social vr instance we started to think about well how can we now think about giving back these lost memories but not as images not as uh video not as you know only text but as a space as an experience and an experience that that multiple people could uh you know join and experience simultaneously so 
I did this version of the same piece, agnosis, for a, a social VR environment. So in, in this particular um, version of it, uh, I took an entire room and filled it with this lost memory sculptures, which are the, you know, these black objects and white objects that you see um, on the screen. And all the data was then rendered on the walls and the ground. And it was the data was generating sound. So there was some generative sound at the same time. And then each of the sculptors, they were uh, speak, they, they, they had a, a text. Uh, to, well, I used the text to speak uh, engine to make a machine just speak out loud the different poems that were written by the system each of the poems corresponding to one of the sculptures. So it was quite an interesting space because in a way it was it was a space of it was the space of my subconscious uh, mind right in a, in, in a in a way um, and when you entered it you were literally immersed in a space um, especially the sound was quite um, immersive in the sense that you started to hear all these whispers from all these sculptures and they were all saying things related to lost memories and if you were you know because of the 3d sound um possibilities the, as, as you got closer closer to a sculpture you will hear that one louder and the other ones uh, less and as you um uh, just went away from moved away from the sculpture you will hear all of them like whispers uh something like a schizophrenic sort of uh mind and there were two spaces and there was some, um, I gave the system some sort of uh, agency to decide which memories went to the dark side, which memories went to the uh, bright side. There was a portal connecting uh, these two spaces and people could move um, from one to the other. And we did um, this performance, let, let me see if I can, quickly open it. So uh, Asher, in, uh, he invited uh, Matt, Matthew Gant from New York, an experimental musician uh, who works doing music in VR. And he invited him to, um, to do a performance with me. And what I did was basically within the space, inside the space, we invited uh, a lot of people to come in. And Matt, he was he had all his um, devices on his side in New York, and I had mine here in Colombia. I was wearing one of those brain scanners and I was streaming brain data to him um, in real time. And he was using, well, almost real time, network time, <clears throat> excuse me. And he was using that data to create music. And at the same time, I was using that data to create real-time graphics with a live coding environment. And I was live streaming that those images uh, to one of the walls in the space. And, and, and th there was a performance for about maybe uh, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Uh, it was quite an experience. And I want to see if I can share with you guys an image of that uh, performance, which uh, I keep in YouTube. Here it is. So let me go. I'm an artist working with technology um, for over a decade now. I've been doing all so you can see we, we are within the space. You can see some of the sculptures around the people, I mean the people who were who came to the performance. Matthew, which is the avatar with, with all these uh, red, blue, and yellow uh, things. And I was right next to him. And so I was I was um, controlling the graphics in the back, with not really controlling, but coding them live. And Matthew was generating live sound out of my brain data. The brain data was the, the sort of seed for the whole thing. So it was another attempt to take these two a sort of performative instance. Let's see. 
So yeah, I mean, if if Asher, if you want, we can we can talk a bit about either of the works. Uh, yes, I think this um, I mean this project that we did at the at the Real Mix Festival, which was in Bogota, actually, um, it was very interesting because uh, it was during the pandemic and uh, people could not really connect, uh, and I think it was a really wonderful, almost like moving experience, touching where. Uh, I invited a lot of the people from the high and hub community that are all over the world. And we all met in this place. And, re and we were able to, you know, chat, move out. You could move to different parts of the room. So you would be <clears throat> getting away from the, from the main performer. So it was a little bit uh, more quiet. And you could actually have a conversation, comment, explore the, the empty spaces and, and go close to it. And you would hear this more and more of these type of sounds going on. So you were almost like a eavesdropping of what was going on there. It was a, it was a very, uh, very interesting experience. One of the most uh, interesting social VR experiences that I did during the pandemic was this one. So, so and, I just and, wonder, and, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that for me, one of the interesting things was to see all these people inside a space that somehow was con constructed out of uh, my brain data given to a system, to a machine who would take some sort with some sort of agency and and create some of these things, you know, some of the objects inside, some of the sounds inside. So it was quite um, weird for me, but also quite beautiful to see all these people within like an <laughs> environment of my own lost memories. It's a bit of like being inside my own my own mind and sharing inside my own mind, you know. Yes, but it felt like uh, being in a speakeasy nightclub in a way. Yeah. <laughs> there with, with all your friends, a lot of people from all over the world that we just met there. And could you uh, could you move a little bit forward to the time when the um, when Matthew Gant is uh, th there is a voice going over ah, well, talking about the. Yes, I know. Let me see if I can find. Phone, ringtone test, end the set. <laughs> okay, this was this was the conversation that came after the um, the event. Uh, we did a type of salon where, where both feet and the and the, um, the sound sound performer were explaining what was happening, what we were seeing. So it was in the terms almost like a you know, performance and salon, a virtual salon. Any who may be watching him or her stumble about in a shabby room. These are but two examples, but each participates in foregrounding, fracturing, perspective, and bodily experience. Virtual reality, however, is not the origin of the fracturing of bodily experience. Bodily experience itself... In Actually, my, my avatar was one of my lost memory sculptures. <laughs> ...must treat its own knowledge so, as a human Yeah, so we, we get an idea... So, so what is the next step from here that you think you you like to take this? And I well, think I'll leave, give, give the word to David and Marsha, who are the experts in this uh, digital storytelling. Uh, but my, the next step is is for this piece is um, a new version of it, uh, which is again uh, oriented towards uh, VR environments that are created out of mind data. Uh, using within the process uh, some some machine learning models for some of the aspects of the creation, and um, it's going to be hopefully an NFT collection uh, that people can buy. And if it works, then ideally we could create a sort of compact version of a wearable device that people could also take. Uh, you know, buy and take home and capture their own memories and create their own worlds uh, out of this mental data. Uh, that's that's the the ideal scenario. But for now, 
I'm going to be starting. I'm working with OpenBCI, um, which is a, a brain computer interface uh, development con uh, company, which is based in New York. And uh, we're going to be uh, launching, uh, hopefully, uh, within this year, uh, this NFT project of uh, a version, an NFT collection out of this project, basically. Okay. So thank you, Fido. Thank you, Washer. I think that we can, you know, get back to Fido later after uh, Marsha and David. I also see that there is a question by Billy Clark, but... Uh, if it is not uh, a problem, I would just uh, move on with Marsha and, and David and then get back at the end again to, to Fido, Asher, et cetera, okay? Of course, um, thank you. So thank you again. So Marsha and David, you are developing very interesting research in the best school of digital art in the world. Um, no, I mean, we are all part of the same institution, so it's what we think of. Um, and please, I mean, go on. Thanks very much. And, and thanks, uh, Peter, for fascinating um, uh, sh showing us all this fascinating work that you've been working on, kind of bringing the internal data set, if you like, the personal data set out into the ether. It's a really fascinating idea. And, yeah, especially because it made me start to think about the attention economy and what about the inattention economy? <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. I, um, we, we, we've been working on a project um, with, with the Nizilla Technology Foundation looking at other kind of issues around data marginalization and, and the kind of harmful effects of bias in uh, you know, working with AI. And I was thinking whilst watching uh, your presentation, Peter, and talking about your work, that you've got a real focus on kind of pers personal data, as I was saying, and actually a lot of these AI models that operate on data are, are based on big data models. And I think there's an idea, you know, this idea of memory is really valuable there because um, you've got kind of like the memory of the, the canon and the, you know, the, the huge amounts, like billions of tokens of data are kind of uh, flooded, flooded into these systems, and then and it's judged by them. But then you get this kind of idea of lost memories being the small kind of marginal test, right? Mm -hmm. Of of, of, of uh, things like GPT three, which is a huge, uh, people who don't know, is like a huge uh, AI system for predicting text prediction effectively, but taken to extreme lengths to the point that it can write whole paragraphs and in some places whole books. So um, yeah, we've got a, a short presentation. Yeah, I guess we'll introduce ourselves first. So yeah. I'm Marsha Kearney, I'm a senior research assistant at the School of Digital Arts and my background is in kind of traditional filmmaking and writing, but also really interested in uh, rights online and copyright and intellectual property. Yeah, I'm David Jackson. I'm a lecturer and researcher at SODA and yeah, my interests are really around kind of creative applications of AI and their effects on audiences. Yeah, so to start, we'll tell you about, well, I mean, we'll just tell you about this one project that we're working on um, together that's uh, as a result of being a recipient of the Mozilla Technology Fund, which we were very mm -hmm. thankful for. Um, and so it's called Algorithm, and David came up with that one, so <laughs> not me. Yeah. Very, we're very it's, happy it's... with the title. Um, um, so basically, last year, uh, we did a project run by volunteers, ourselves and volunteers, through the Mozilla network where we made a short story collection, a sci-fi short story collection using AI Dungeon, which is a kind of RPG uh, writing tool. And so we had about 10 people in our group. Um, like it was a mix of a writing group and a reading group. We used GPT-3 and 2 to kind of see the difference between uh, the language models there. And what we were trying to do was start to, I guess, talk about how to launder out bias in these, um, in these large language models. But especially in situations where it's complicated to disentangle, you know, the feelings and intentions of the author from things like narrative and generic tropes that are necessary to kind of show the, the pendulum swinging of human emotion and storytelling. Um, otherwise, you know, if you take out all sort of reprehensible characters and villains and people who are saying bad stuff, how do you do storytelling? But can we do that with AI, but in a way that kind of reduces the amount of harmful bias that's being produced there. Yeah, 
and the you know kind of um the, the idea of kind of going to a lot a lot of research into um <clears throat> the bias in AI is kind of meant to do it into a sort of a kind of bad faith faith model as in you kind of you you poke at the AI model with um you know biased statements and you let it finish in a biased way and then you go there you go see it's a biased model <laughs> and what we wanted to do is try and genuinely create kind of works of fiction as creatives and and and, and then see what came out and um, so yeah the group uh, published algorithm the collection is it's available at algorithm.org um, and then there was a, a weekend at Moz, Mozilla Festival uh, 2021 um, of online curated discussion. We had some really interesting discussions around things like bias laundering um, and, and other effects of GPT-3 and bias. Um, so, and yeah, people were encouraged to comment and you're still encouraged to comment if you're interested on in the margins, if you like, of these stories on what you find funny, interesting, strange, weird, and biased about them and really just keep on creating that debate. Yeah, and we had, um, I think, four or five takeaways that we thought were really interesting. We talked about some of them already, so we'll just go through them, but algorithmic bias versus genre bias. So what is coming from the system um, that is a result of it being trained on you know, 4chan and Reddit and the worst of YouTube comments um, imaginable, and what actually is coming from the, the sort of storytelling trope. Like if we're looking at sci-fi, um, what are the things that make something sci-fi and hold it up as sci-fi, but aren't influenced necessarily by um, by the harmful views of writers from the past or present? Yeah, because it's based on like um, a, lot, a lot, billions of tokens of uh, fiction as well. So it's not just web, web content. So yeah, really hard to tell. Character bias versus narratorial bias, similar kind of thing. Is so like uh, if you have a character, so how do you tell a story about uh, I know sexism without and a, and a feminist story um, about sexism without having a sexist character? Um, and that, so one of the problems with uh, these fiction models is they're forgetful. So going back to memory, they kind of they they might start with the assumption that a character is going to get its comeuppance, a sexist character is going to get their comeuppance. But after maybe two or three paragraphs, it might start to forget that character because it can only hold so much in its memory before it starts to write more stuff. So then you completely, you just have a sexist character and you just kind of carry on being sexist and there's no come up. So, so there's issues there around the narrator usually has control of, of uh, the overall direction of a story and it's harder to tell in these models. Yeah, so de defaulted biases, biases inhibit old, old new takes on genre fiction. So this is um, in direct reference to David putting Samuel Delaney, some of Samuel Delaney's work um, into the language model, who was, um, you know, uh, ahead of his time as far as a marginalized writer and with elements of kind of homosexuality that were really um, kind of new at the time and different. And so if we take these, uh, these writers and kind of recursively put them back into the machine, the machine kind of pushes them more towards center again into this kind of uh, heteronormative um, expression of love and everything. So even taking authors that we know, um, we're pushing those boundaries, putting them back in the system years later, um, they're still being kind of nudged toward that, um, yeah, heteronormative. But why would you say this, she asked, because I love you, um, you know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and we also saw, uh, we also had some issues of um, how, how reliable these workshops were and re um, a reflection of particular models because at the time it was very hard to use GPT-3 um, directly, but it's now an open access model and um, commercial model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this one is, I think, one of the really interesting ones, and David, if you have anything to add from this point, uh, because one of our volunteers, her name is Young Ah, and she was showing us a story, but was kind of unsure about how to get across that the AI author is not a discrete entity. So it's not as though its first response is how it act actually feels or its second response of, you know, once you really dig, this is how the algorithm actually feels, that this kind of authorial plurality is, is really impassive um, from the point of view of the AI that will give you this instance of a story versus this instance of a story, a complete non-hierarchical way. But because of who we are as people and how we're used to taking people at their sort of 
first impression, we think of, you know, the first role is, is the real one and then the other ones were the other ones. So she did this really clever thing where she put columns up next to each other to show um, the different instances of the, of the authorial intent from the algorithm. Mm. It makes it, yeah, it's that kind of a model, we have a human model of understanding of this kind of thing, like an appreciative questioning, I think it is, uh, Lance Weiler uses it in some of his immersive work. But it, you know, it's that thing you ask it once and someone gives an off pack answer, and then you ask it again, and the people go, hmm, I'm gonna really think about this, and they start to dig into it. But obviously, with a machine that's just pattern effectively pattern matching, and um, it's not doing that, but it looks like it is. And we think we have that mental model. So yeah, that was really, really interesting. Um, yeah, and, and just to point that we we compared two different GPT systems and they had very different kind of traits of bias as well. Like GPT-2 would really flip anything you gave it, it would really flip. So if you put in um, um, an issue with um, someone who had been unfairly dismissed at uh, work, suddenly the person talking to them is uh, belongs to the Nazi party. It just, it just takes, you know, the cue of, um, you know, narrative is to kind of create extremes and, and it takes it to the extreme. And it's, and it's quite kind of tone deaf in that respect. But you don't see that in GPT-3. So, it was a reminder to us that these models won't won't carry on having the same problems and the same biases, and we have to be adaptive depending on which um, AI system we use. Mm, but it was really echoing the kind of escalation framework of like a YouTube suggestion algorithm mm. in a way, but in a in, in narrative expression. So yeah, right now we are working on the next phase of the project, which we're calling Stepford. Um, it's a critical tool for creative practitioners who want to ideate with AI. So what we're trying to do is introduce a sort of layer of self-reflexivity to some of these, to, to this using GPT-3 to write stories. So it's GPT-3 um, analyzing text for sexism um, because gender bias is where we just decided to start because it seemed like a, an easier place to start than racial and ethnic bias, to be honest. Um, because it's more of a kind of on off switch Finally. culturally, yes. So <laughs> the tool analyzes text for sexism and then gives you an, the analysis and you have to then either agree or disagree with, uh, with its estimation. Yeah, so um, yeah, kind of a um, synthetic internal model in, in some extent. And <clears throat> so the idea, um, our, our kind of roadmap for developing this is two phases. We're going to, we're asking people to sign up um, to the study where, and they then have to review a selection of narrative texts um, that have had the, the uh, Stepford app look at them and, and spot uh, instances that think are sexist. And then um, we look at those and we update the model and, and keep going like that until we have a large uh, corpus of um, kind of scored uh, instances of sexism in the in the text, and we will show you an example in a minute, which makes this clearer. Yeah. Nice. I've got multiple screens here. I don't know where my cursor is. This one, yeah, in the bottom yeah. The corner. Yeah. Have it. So I okay. just full screen that if we can. Okay, I'm not sure that's very clear. Um, <clears throat> on the left, we've got a text which says, "You are a woman in a man's world." You have just. This is something that GPT three created. You've just gotten a job as a construction worker, something that is unheard of. You say, "Why don't women usually get jobs as construction workers?" And um, the boss says, "Well, women don't usually want to get their hands dirty." Dismissively, he says that. So, and um, the the AI has picked out, "You are a woman in a man's world." And it suggests that, um, that the whole world uh, is a whole world where women have no place. And um, that that's marked as agree. So we've asked someone to go in and mark that. They said if that's five out of five, that's sexist. It's chosen, you have just gotten a job as a construction worker, something that's been heard of in the text. And it's step that suggests, states that female construction workers are very uncommon, which is based on a sexist stereotype. So we, we, this, this reviewer says, yeah, we agree with this. Um, and then finally, well, women usually don't want to get their hands dirty. It's based on an provable generalization. 
So this is this is things that the, the system is bringing back as suggested steps, and and we're giving that a pause. So <laughs> the idea um, of doing this is that we create a more complex idea of a new, more nuanced idea of this kind of mental model of what constitutes sexism in a in a narrative text. Um, so yeah. Um, David, I just I just want to make sure that we give space for some questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like uh, there is a question from Billy, for example. Yeah, fantastic. Um, we're, we're, we're about done now. So. We still have uh, 13, 13 minutes to finish, so it's uh, we have we want to add some like a, a way to have a conversation yeah. between the two of you. Can, can we finish then with a plug? Actually, yeah. just that, that if people want to get involved with this project, um, <laughs> yes, of course, go on, David. Go on. I mean, it's not That's a done. problem That's if you if if we if we Thank go. You. Five minutes <laughs> to extend five minutes. Because Asher is always uh, too precise, you know. Thank you. Go ahead. What did you want to sign on? Or was it? Did we get it? Okay. Um, Algorithm.org. We can, we can put it in I'll the chat. In the chat yeah. Oh, yeah. Perfect. For everyone. So, anyway, we have a, a question from the uh, audience. Uh, uh, actually, there is a question from uh, um, Billy Clark, who say, can you talk about the role to Fido, the role of chance in your work? You create system and design element that you have created control over, but then put them into the world in ways that produce unexpected results. I'm interested to hear more about this and why it is important to your work and creative process to relinquish full control. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Billy, for the question. Yes, it is very important uh, for me to relinquish control um, as a way of, um, you know, as part of the, the whole piece, as part of the story of submitting my, myself, in this case, submitting my inner self, you could say, to a system uh, which will somehow uh, judge it or or make a judgment out of it and, and give it back to me. Um, that's, that's my whole thing. Now, the, the role of chance, um, chance is quite a word. Um, and when we're speaking about intelligent systems um, and speaking about chance is quite difficult because things start being random and then they start organizing themselves and creative path, creating patterns and things that we can recognize. So in that sense, you know, uh, you might give yourself to chance, but these intelligent systems will somehow also organize that all that noise that your, um, in this case, my brain was producing, because basically it really produces just noise, uh, which to our eyes uh, looks random, uh, but then eventually it, it uh, the system creates meaning out of it, and that's that's the interesting part for me, like creating meaning out of things that seem seem to be meaningless um those things are given by myself to a system which then uh, determines what they mean in a way um and it's very related to to what we were listening from marsh and david now because uh in a way um these systems will start judging me based on all this uh big data that was given to them uh when they were trained which is quite interesting uh, as well to see. Although I've never focused my work on that, uh, I think uh, it's very relevant. Uh, you you will definitely find it all over the poems written by the by the system. Um, so I'm not sure. Believe that that answers your question. Um, but yeah, I, I mean the, the the part of having created control and then relinquishing control. That's quite interesting. That, because what we do is, as, as artists working with new media, especially with these processes and generative uh, systems, is that you do set up, you do uh, prepare a set of rules in your code uh, based on some aesthetic decisions that you, as an artist, make. Yeah, so you do make some aesthetic decisions, but then what happens after there is totally out of your control. So your control is quite limited to establishing a very simple set of rules and, and these rules are mainly uh, rules of uh, aesthetic rules and rules of 
based on, in, in the case of agnosis, how to organize the objects in the space, how the form of the objects and all that. There are rules for creating those, but I don't control the data that comes in. Therefore, there's no way I can predict uh, the result. So, yeah. Thank you, Billy. And Asher, I know that you have a question for Marsha and David. I know uh, if you if you're not, I mean, let's uh, see because I mean, let me see. There are probably other questions. <laughs> Because we only have eight minutes to finish, so let's uh, maybe um, try to like uh, I don't know leave that to uh, 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 Fito. Could you give us a, a brief info of the project that you are doing with the uh, based on Gabriel Garcia Marquez novels in in Cartagena? Uh, yeah, it's actually in Santa Marta, and it's um, a city next to Cartagena. Yeah, in the coast. It's actually the, the oldest, I mean, it's, it's the city uh, through which uh, the Spanish came to, to South America. So anyway, the, uh, uh, the, the project is we're building these VR stations, three of them in different parts of the whole department. The, the department is like the state here in Colombia. And, um, and we are creating a narrative out of 12 scenarios all around this um, uh, state. Um, all with Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, you know, magical realism uh, sort of uh, narrative. And, and uh, there are going to be 14 immersive spaces built for people to come and, and just, you know, live it. And, and the whole purpose is to connect, especially tourists who come and go to these places with the places. So eventually they will be able to, you know, wear the headset and, and walk over a, um, a, a, you know, one of those walk uh, the, um, controllers for VR. And they can even choose to go to those places physically. And if they do, then they will be connected immediately to like a local person who can take care of them and take, in, take them to all these places and things like that. So it, it is another way of connecting very different worlds um, in, in very practical project, more than artistic, um, but it has a very nice artistic component where I think I might uh, want to talk with, uh, with Marsha and David later because we're going to be generating some um, scripts for the experiences and, and we've been considering the role of VR, of, of, of AI, sorry, on the construction of some of these scenarios. So maybe, yeah. And, um... There is also a question for Marsha and David, uh, which is a very important question. Um, do, you feel, do you feel hopeful or uh, pessimistic in regards to AI in art making? Yeah, um, I, I think, there's, I think as, as, as Pete so admirably uh, you know, uh, ex 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 exemplified, there's, there's loads of really uh, interesting uh, things that artists can do, but more importantly, I think it, there's loads of ways that um, <clears throat> it helps us be critical of current culture, you know, and, and where these, these uh, technologies are taken forwards. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of mass, you know, almost uniquely the size of, um, you know, the, the commerce engine, if you like, around some of these tools is, is mind blowing. So they, they've got a very prescribed future for um, how we're going to use these technologies. So I think asking these questions around bias, around personal data, I think are really, I think I've got a lot of optimism if we have people being critical in the way uh, FITO is, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Especially the sort of everyday nature of it, um, like that these are your lived experiences. This is your, um, this is how we interact with technology on a daily basis, because this kind of the creative AI use cases are not necessarily going to be these huge Hollywood movies, you know, like the new this movie uh, was written by an AI kind of thing. It's more going to be those these little daily interventions of where text gets automated. So if we're being really critical of the adoption and this at this everyday level and accepting that this isn't some, you know, magical entity that's going to revolutionize creativity, but that we do have these kind of black box 
sort of models, like Fido was saying, of it goes in and it comes out and you don't know necessarily how or why it does something. And the, the less we are okay with the not knowing how and why, I think the more optimistic I am, just because it will allow us to not defer our creative decisions or our ethical decisions to a machine, but to yeah, remain engaged with them the whole time. Yeah, and I'm really interested in Vito's project as well. Yeah, yeah we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was just going to say that actually, as, as an artist, for me, it's quite interesting to explore the errors and the, I mean, the apparent errors. I call them apparent errors, you know, the, the, the sort of misreadings of, of these intelligent systems, especially the image recognition ones, because they are all the time saying uh, crazy stuff. And, but this crazy stuff they say, um, I try to see it not as a mistake or a limitation in terms of technology, but rather a, a, a cognition uh, phenomena, which we also find in the human mind, right? So, so it's quite interesting to see all these errors because they help you understand reality in, in a deeper way, actually. I think that's a really nice point. And, the, you know, there's this kind of common, and Safia Noble is a theorist of, from the kind of like the black internet and um, et cetera. Um, and she speaks about, you know, this idea that constantly people at Google say, this is a glitch, this is a bug. Actually, right. you know, she would argue this is like, you know, where, it, where there are problems with waste kind of data, it's big, it's actually part of the way we made and it's, it's central to it. Yeah, so it's, that's it's, it's, it's not a glitch, it's reality. I mean, it, it can happen to us as well. I might look through the window is, and see something that was not there, right? I could also project uh, something. My mind can project something out of something else. And that's what's happening when they say, you know, this machine has a glitch. It just, you know, didn't recognize this as, as it's supposed to. Well, mm -hmm. guess what? We also have those mistakes. So, so where's the problem? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's really fascinating. It's like, uh, I think there's a um, ghost thing is like, I like the, the, the when you see something and thinks it's an object, but it's just yeah. a piece of, uh, it, it's called ghosting apparently. I like that idea of that. that like you said, that, you know, we see ghosts and machines yeah. see ghosts as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and, if a, and if a person saw patterns and was drawing connections between things, they would be called a conspiracy theorist, but uh, an AI does it inside of you, you know? Just machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, okay. um, we we arrive at uh, at the hour. Where uh, so I want to uh, thank again all of you guys, Marcia, David, for being so gracious as always, and Valentino, the great Valentino, you know, for uh, who is the curator of the artistic side of this, um, Toby Heiss. The, the director of the faculty, so that who also been part of this behind the scene, and uh, of course Billy Billy Clark has been such a supportive of all, all the hyphen hub projects, um, and allow this platform to happen. This uh, our first official meeting between the three organizations, which I hope is going to lead to many more um, versions of this, which uh, we are talking about from the conversations to residencies to exhibitions when the the, 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 the gallery at uh, the School of Digital Arts is going to officially open on June 22nd, is it? Uh, who knows? I mean... Uh, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, so... Yes, the 23. 23. 23. Okay, so yeah. And th thank, thank you, Asher, F, because at the end of the day, at the end, you know, you have the, you've been the deus ex machina of all of this, you know, so thank you. So, thank so yeah. you guys, and I appreciate it. Okay. Nice to see you, Asher. Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Asher. Thank you all. And thank you very much, Vito. Uh, sorry. Thank you for like being such a great, great as always. And um, always fascinating with uh, Fito's stories and views of the world through his artistic. <laughs> and, and, and it has been you. very good also. It has been a, very good for me as well to understand what my colleagues do, because I mean, <laughs> Uh, we are in the same team. We meet almost every day, but you know there is. No, we are also busy, and sometimes it's difficult to understand what we what we do. You know, but uh, um, there's yeah. a little bit there. <laughs> so okay. okay, thank you. Cheers.